I want to. I, I do have a word today that. Um, full disclosure: I, I worked all week on reading and studying, and and I sometimes get. I could sometimes preach three sermons a day, and then there's other times when I've got all kinds of stuff and nothing at the same time, which is. Uh, that's not entirely true because I could always just get up and talk, really. I mean, I could just talk and like let stuff come out and, and probably would end up speaking something the room needs, but I don't like to come into it that way. I like to let that, I do that anyway, but I like to have somewhere to go once that front piece is done, you know? And, and so I, all week, you're just talking to the Lord and, and sometimes it's a little difficult because you're editing one, I edit on Monday, so you set through one sermon, then you get ready for Tuesday, then you do four days of podcasts, and then you go, I don't have another, anything else. And so all the way up till yesterday, I just was in the Word and just not getting anything locked in. And then I felt like the Lord gave me the text. He gave me this in two waves. He gave me the text yesterday with really nothing. And not that I hadn't preached it before, but I like it fresh. I don't like recycled stuff. It's like, oh, I could just do that again. So I got the text. I said, well, he's got to have a fresh spin. And so that came this morning, early, where I just felt like, okay, God is wanting to say something to the room today and say something to, and by the room, I do literally mean who's here, but also who's with us live and who's tracking with us. And and, uh, because I take, honestly, I think of them as much as whoever's in the room because they, because they're, it's just as real. The, the, The power of the Holy Spirit is just as real through Facebook or 48 hours later or whatever, a year later. It's just as powerful. Um, and it's the, I, wanna, I title this little lesson The Possibility of Transformation, but I really want to work my way into that. because the, the, I call it the possibility because the, I think that's what the finished work does for us. It gives us the possibility to literally transform. And I don't, of course, mean physically, um, although I guess there could be something to that as well, but it really the power to be somebody different. Um, or the power to, to change the things about us that need changed about us. And part of that is identifying what needs changed about us. And that is not as easy as it sounds because sometimes when you come into an understanding of the finished work or you come into an understanding of the love of God or grace, you start to realize there were things about you that should have changed and then they, you were trying to change some things about you that was okay as well. And that, that's, that's unique to each person, I think. It's some of that we have to work through. but. I I had a couple principles as I was working through this early this morning that I wrote down and I wanted to put them up for you. And they're not going to sound like anything you've seen in Scripture at first. But I promise you that coupled with where I know we're going to go in Scripture, I think there's something to be said for this idea. Um, Let's start here. Do not make victimhood the center of your identity The reason I say this is because victimhood will trap you if you make it the center of your identity. And we're in a culture war in which victimhood is a part of people's personal identity, that they literally identify by what's been done to them, what's being done to them, the fact that they feel like they are in a minority or that they are definitely in a minority or that they have been wronged or hurt. The reality is, is that everyone in this room, in one way or the other, has been a victim of something. You can, we could stand here all day and come up with all the stuff we've been victims to, and it's not, it doesn't do us any good. You know what you've been victim to, and some of them are horrendous, and you don't want to talk about them, and you don't need to. I'm not, that's not what this is about. And some of them are things that aren't quite so horrendous, but you were certainly victimized by them. But if you make victimhood the center of your identity, where you begin to determine who you are based upon some of the things that has happened to you, it's not just damaging to who you are spiritually. It actually traps you emotionally. It traps you societally. It traps you domestically. It traps you in every place that you are because you're not allowed to expand outside of victimhood or I say it this way, our culture values victims over heroes. I I want to stay on that top one for a moment. Um, 
we are, and, and well, I'll tell you what, let's put them both together because there's some things that need to be said with both. Our culture values victims over heroes. And our culture teaches us that to improve your lot, I don't think they teach us this explicitly. I think they teach us this subtly. To improve your lot in life would be to lose your victimhood. And that's an unappealing outcome in today's value system. In other words, victimhood has become such a catch phrase. It's become such a, a, a focus identifying that you're a victim that we have almost lost our admiration for the heroic and we applaud the victim. The story doesn't matter if someone has overcome it. The story is successful as long as someone is a victim and we can all rally around them someday overcoming it. That's become sort of our news cycle. We don't need them to have overcome anything. We just need people to not like them for what they are or to deny them opportunities or to cut them down. That's the story. We get off on hearing about victimhoods and people wronged and people that are abused and people that have been talked about and people that haven't been given an opportunity. It doesn't even matter if they get opportunity. In fact, there's almost this thing that if they got opportunity and then took it and then excelled, their story's less appealing because now they're a victor, not a victim. We've become a society more enamored of victims than victors. You don't make for a great story if you're a victor anymore. And I think that's tragic because we need the heroic. We need to see David drop Goliath. We don't need to hear how David can't beat Goliath over and over again. That's sort of that victimhood mentality. We need to see it happen and we need to celebrate that it's happened. And that's using a spiritual example. But the, the idea that if we would improve who we are and then that we would somehow lose a, a place in society's eyes... Um, I think is a tragedy. And I think it's led us in some respects to celebrating victimhood. And where, where does that affect me as a gospel of grace minister? Well, because I, I, I think that the message of grace is worth it or I wouldn't bother. I think that it, is, it will transform lives. I think that as people see Christ, they'll have a complete transformation of who they are inside and that will affect the outside. And I don't just mean your physical frame, I mean your attitude and the way you treat your neighbor, and the way you live, and the way you love, and, and the, the way you respond. That's transformation that is possible. But I also, I think that we're confusing the gospel message sometimes. And so I say it this way. Don't confuse the gospels, and I say possessive, because I think the gospel holds this. Don't confuse the gospel message of God loves you as you are with be satisfied with what you are doing. The gospel says God loves you as you are. Don't confuse that with you should be satisfied with how you're acting. And my, what I've seen in the message of grace is those two things have morphed into the same thing where we're telling people, listen, God loves you as you are. Don't be dissatisfied with your actions. And I disagree. I think it's okay to be dissatisfied with your actions. <laughs> if you're not dissatisfied with your actions, you're not going to change them. And people will say, well, what's it matter if you change your actions? God loves you like you are. So who cares if you change your actions? And I think where we've messed up is we have forgotten that God loves you as you are and, can declare, and declares you righteous based upon faith. And he never takes your righteousness away because of the way you act. The way you act and the way you live is what affects you day to day and affects your neighbor day to day. And by your neighbor, I don't mean the guy that lives next to you. As much as I do the person maybe that sleeps next to you or the person that works next to you or the person that has to call you their brother or their kid or their parent or whatever. You affect all of those lives by what you do and how you act. Your righteous independent of what you do and how you act, that needs declared over and over and over because we'll forget it if it's not declared over and over again. But you're not incapable of behavioral change. 
because you're in grace. And saying that you think you should change should not make you condemned by grace people. Because I've seen that happen a lot. You know, don't, don't talk about change. Don't worry about change because you're the righteous of God in Christ. Absolutely you are. And there's a transformation that has to happen in the realm of the spirit. But let's not confuse the gospel message that God loves you as you are with, hey, you should always be satisfied with the way you're acting. Because the reality is, I think we all know this by common sense. We're not always satisfied with the way that we're acting. And sometimes the way that we're acting, the reason that we're not satisfied with it is because we are God's children. And the sound of the Spirit inside of us is going, what are you doing acting like this as a member of the kingdom? And if we're not careful, we'll dismiss that voice and say, no, that's legalism. That's legalism trying to tell me how I ought to act. And if that voice is telling you how you ought to act so that you're righteous, then yes, that's legalism. But if that voice telling you how you ought to act because you're one of God's kids, that's not legalism. That's you listening to your father. And there's a difference. And you, well, how do we know the difference? I, I start with the baseline of, are you doing what you do to be righteous? Or are you doing what you do to maybe make your world a little better? Or maybe make your neighbor's world a little better? And if the last one is what you're talking about, yeah, I'm doing this to make my world a little better, make my neighbor's world a little better, then I would say congratulations and keep it up because change is a good thing. If you're doing what you're doing because you think it'll make you righteous or favored or anointed or blessed, or, then you're 2,000 years too late. God's already been appeased by the finished work of Christ. He doesn't need you to give more, do more, fast more, go more, pray more, praise more, witness more, read more, so that he can bless you. You've, your value system, your currency exchange is messed up. God's not looking for you to do so that God can dole out. But let's make sure we understand the two. And I personally think a mark of spiritual maturity is, the, is being able to understand the difference in those two concepts. And the mark of spiritual maturity is being able to go, yes, I know who I am in Christ. Nothing changes that. I'm also not satisfied with what I'm doing. I'm not satisfied with some of the things I'm saying. I'm not satisfied with the way I'm acting. I'm not satisfied with the way I just treated that guy. I'm not satisfied with how I responded to that situation. I want to do better. And I'm not going to just lazily throw up my feet and go, oh, well, I am what I am. No, I'm going to do what I need to do to make my relationships better and to make my life better. I can't make myself more righteous. There's the, that's that. I don't even think that's that fine a line. I think we've made that a real fine line. And maybe we made it a fine line because we attacked doing so much out of the gate when we come into grace. Because that's the easy sledgehammer to swing is anything, because I remember early on when I came into grace, I heard someone preach a sermon that said, anytime you hear a preacher say ought in his or her sermon, you're hearing legalism. And I latched onto that because I was new to the message of grace. And I thought, hmm, that's a good, that's a good litmus test. So if the guy gets up and goes, you ought to be doing this, I go, uh-oh, legalism, watch out. And then as I grew in grace, I realized, wait, just because it says ought doesn't mean it's, because what happened is I was reading the New Testament where the apostle Paul told us how we ought to act. And I remember reading that thinking, hmm, was Paul preaching law or <laughs> might I ought to act different in the way that I'm living? And so I, I fell on the side of I ought to act differently. There's an there's a Old Testament conclusion I want to draw today and there's a New Testament conclusion I want to draw today in regards to your ability to transform. Now, I'm not talking about your ability to be nice or your ability to treat your neighbor better. Sometimes you just need to stop being a jerk. And it doesn't have anything to do with you transforming in the realm of the spirit, really. I mean, it just has to do with you. <laughs> it just has to do with you treating people. Simple golden rule of Christianity is basically you look at people and go, how do I wish people would treat me right now? Let's try that on for a while and then give that a whirl. And if you, if you can live in that manner, I think you'll see your world improve. I'm not saying the world will be nice to you and everything will go your way, but you'll definitely make your world a little better by just treating people the way you wish they would treat you. And it's not easy to do. If anybody tells you it's easy to do, they're either lying or they've not tried it. Because it's not easy to treat other people the way you wish they would treat you. It's way easier to treat them the way they're acting. Yeah. And the way that would give you the most satisfaction, mm -hmm. which is sometimes to feed your vengeance and your, your envy or whatever. And so I'm not telling you it's easy. but. 
that has that's been around forever. No covenant. We didn't need an old covenant or a new covenant to be good to our neighbor. Okay? You can't say, well, it's old covenant. They, they couldn't be good to their neighbor. That's bull. In fact, the old covenant, God said, take care of the widows and the strangers and the fatherless and feed the people that are hungry. In other words, be good to people uh, because that's the right thing to do because you're human. You're not an animal. You don't just go devour people that you don't like or that tick you off. And so be human to people. That's old covenant. That's not, that's, you don't need spiritualism to do that. But the Old Testament definitely had a way of viewing us in which there was no true heart transformation that was possible. All you could really do was modify your behavior. So you could stop lying as much or stop stealing or stop lying. But you couldn't change anything about who you were. The ultimate Old Testament example, this is Jeremiah 13, 23. Most of us have heard this quoted. We might not have realized this is God talking, by the way. This is God talking through Jeremiah to Israel. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to doing evil. And there's a, a kind of an undertow in the Old Testament that what a man gives into becomes easier for that man to do. Genesis tries to lay that case out. It gives you the contrast of one kid doing the right thing and one kid doing the wrong thing. Cain and Abel. And the Cain and Abel story is, I don't want to reteach it, but it's really fast. It stands really large in the pantheon of Bible, but it's really small in text. It doesn't last very long. And it's the ultimate example of how we treat our neighbor. It's specifically the ultimate example of sibling rivalry and jealousy gone to seed. And of course it ends horrific with Cain destroying his younger brother Abel and doesn't realize that, yes, you are your brother's keeper. That's the whole point. He missed that. God goes, Don't, aren't you? Abel, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? As if, you know, why would I be? And the reality is, yes, you are. But the Cain and Abel story is to show us that once a man slips into evil, it's easier to slip into a little more evil, a little more evil. That darkness compounds. But he, he learned that from mom and dad. They eat from the tree and then they put on aprons and then they hide in bushes and it gets worse and it gets worse and, and they lie about it and, and they run from God. Notice the spiral downward. And that's sort of what God is saying because here we are at the, sort of the apex of the Old Testament. We're on our way into the minor prophets and we're heading to, to the New Testament. So God's conclusion is, look, can the Ethiopian change the color of their skin? Can a leopard change his spots? The answer is no. That's what happens. You start to do evil. For you to try to turn and do good, impossible because you are not a good people. And that's kind of the Old Testament conclusion. You know, welcome. Again, this doesn't have anything to do with what, how you treat your neighbor. This is you in the realm of the Spirit. You can't get better in the realm of the Spirit because you think about it. You are what you are. And so as you go into darkness, you go into more of it. And James would sum it up this way. A man breaks one law, what's he done? He broke them all. Why? Because you don't, you don't take a dalliance with evil. You don't, you don't play with darkness and then remain light in the old covenant world. So it's like you're there. It begins to spot you. It is who you are. And then comes Jesus. And Jesus, of course, is the ultimate transition. Everything starts to change. Well, let me say that better. In Jesus, yes, everything starts to change. Let me add to it. Jesus starts to show us what dad looked like. And we, we, we missed it. We didn't know. because we're, we're, It's difficult because we're looking at God through this prism of the Old Testament. And Jesus comes as a real man. And he's, he's living and breathing and moving and touching lives and speaking. And, and we're watching how he treats humanity. And it blows minds when they watch how Jesus treats his fellow man. And Jesus gives the possibility that hadn't been there in the Old Testament. The, the true possibility of transformation. It looks something like this. this would, we'll get here in John a long time from now. John 9, 39. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, Jesus said, for judgment, I've come into this world. Now, watch this, because this is, this is unprecedented. This, this hits us as theology. It's like, oh, I've heard that in Sunday school my whole life. Then you're, it's cheap if that's the way you look at this, because you're not looking at it as they would have looked at it. Nobody had ever been healed of blindness in the history of the world until Jesus comes and heals people blind. Okay. It's the ultimate leopard spot, Ethiopian skin. Blindness. You can't, you can't do anything about it. No one's ever done anything about it. Jesus said, for judgment, I come into this world 
that those who do not see may see and that those who see may be made blind. This is its own sermon. <laughs> this verse needs its own time. We've done it before and we'll do it again when we get there. But <clears throat> Jesus is most certainly telling us, some of you can see and you see things you shouldn't be able to see. And I'm going to close your eyes to those things. And I think he does that to Saul on the road to Damascus. He closes his eyes to his old Saul so he can open them to a new Paul. But he also says there's some of you who can't see that are going to see. And this is the ultimate spiritual transformation because no one's ever been healed of blindness. And so Jesus says, I am coming to take what a man is and change it. I am, I am the road to true transformation. I can literally change the skin and the spot. This is Jesus' statement. Uh, also, and this is, I, I don't like to do this verse without bringing this out because I think it's a translation issue that would help us. When Jesus says for judgment, he uses the Greek word ice, E-I-S. It's pronounced ice, like literally like frozen water, for the word for. But it's a bad translation. The word ice, when used in a sentence like this, would not have been the word for, for judgment. Because this makes it look as if Jesus is saying, I came to judge between the blind man and the, and the sighted man. But the word ice is better translated into. So Jesus' statement is actually into judgment I came so that I can make blind people see and sighted people be made blind. I came to step into their judgment. And so this is really a judgment passage that leads you to the cross to say, I came to be judged on behalf of blind men. I came to be judged on behalf of sighted men. Guess what? He covered everybody. So both the sighted man and the blind man, Jesus said, I came to be judged in his place for one purpose, true transformation, so that the man who can see things he shouldn't see won't be able to see them anymore. You could take that, maybe this takes it to the breaking point, but you could take that to say, so that the man who sees things he shouldn't see in the realm of the spirit, he can be blind to. Maybe he sees his past or he sees his condemnation, or he sees his failure, or he sees his shame, and he shouldn't see that because he's my child, and I've been judged on his behalf, and so I'm going to blind him to his failure. Or maybe it is also for people who are blind spiritually, who do not have insight into how much their father loves them, and into who they are, and into their identity. And Jesus says, I'm going to be judged on that man's behalf, so that the blind man can see the reality of the world around him. Maybe you've been blind to your neighbor. I'm going to open your eyes so that you see that your neighbor matters to me as much as you do. Or you've been blind to the realities of the world and I'm going to open your eyes to that. Some of us need blinded to some things and we need our eyes open to other things. And he's the ultimate arbiter of those two. And that's why he said, into judgment I come. Because I'm going to be the one that judges the difference between whether you need to see or whether you need to be made blind. I don't know if you need to be made to see or you need to be made blind. I'm not the arbiter. I didn't come into judgment. And I don't know why we think it's our job to make sure that other people know what they should see. In fact, Jesus dealt with this when he said, stop trying to get specks out of people's eyes when you have a beam hanging out of your own eye. That was another way of saying, who are you? You have problems. And let me take care of the, your problems. And then sure, you can assist with the speck because the speck will be nothing once you get rid of the beam, sort of that thing. But that's the kind of transformation that is only possible through what Jesus did because he came into judgment. Now, all of that as a setup for the story that uh, I've preached many times and, and have taught and wrote about, but really felt strongly yesterday to go back across this text and you're going to recognize it immediately. I'm going to read the Mark version, although this appears in several Gospels. This is the Mark version that uses a word Paul grabs and uses. This is what we often call the mountain of transfiguration. Okay. Mark 9, starting in 2. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And there's a word you want to sort of jot down, take notes on, the word transfigure. That's an unusual word. It's unusual in English for sure, but it's even unusual in Greek. We'll get to that. He was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow. I don't know why I like this, but I like Mark's attempt right here. I've always thought this was 
just an interesting way to say this that no other gospel writer went for. Like everybody else is just content to go, it was really white. <laughs> and then Mark goes, no, you know what? I can do better than that. It was white such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Most of us would have been satisfied with the simile like snow. You know, it would have worked. He goes, white like snow. He goes, no, I think this is just an example. Mark is a bit infatuated with his own ability <laughs> to write. And I'm okay with that. He's pretty excited. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Before I read any further, and I'll cover this more in a moment, just want you to get how this, every time we read this story, we just fly past this like it's normal. Three dudes standing on a hill with Jesus and he turns white like no launderer can whiten his clothes. And boom, there's Moses and Elijah. And we just kind of move on like, that's normal. Mark, this is, this is off the charts what is happening on this mountain. And there's more than meets the eye without a doubt. Let's read through it first though, because there's some things we want to get to. Peter answered and said to Jesus, I love Peter. He always answers when no one asks him a question. <laughs> Peter answered and it would have been okay if Jesus had said, what do you, I, no one asked you, Peter. <laughs> Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And that is the most telling line in this passage. He didn't know what to say. So what did he come up with? How about we build three little houses? <laughs> Let's build three houses. We put Moses in one house. We put Elijah in one house. We put you in one house. Peter's bum -fazzled. How can he not be? How does he recognize Moses and Elijah? That's what I want to know. It's not like there were pictures of them. You know, like people have posters in town. Of what Moses looks like. Nobody knows what Moses and Elijah look like. That's important, though. I know that seems like a... Just something to brush over, but it's important that he recognizes them. There's a reason why he recognizes them. We'll, get, I'm gonna, we'll dig into some of this a little more as we go, but I'm just kind of bringing out the highlights. He didn't know what to say. He was greatly afraid, and a child, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And this is not the only time that some voice speaks out of some cloud and says, this is my beloved son. This is the same voice, the same presence, that says as much when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. And of course, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There's a little bit different tag, but it's the same thing. It's, this is my beloved son. And this is an, a, an invisible voice, which everybody there would claim to be God, saying audibly, this is the guy. And this is, John had said there's a guy coming, and then Jesus comes up and gets baptized, and a voice goes, this is the guy. And then Jesus is surrounded by Moses and Elijah, and there's another voice that says, this is the guy. And so there's a very pointed thing that Mark is doing that sort of speaks back uh, in some ways, speaks back a little bit to that, to that baptismal moment. Uh, go to the top at two. <clears throat> oh, we're not done, are we? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Do we, do we finish? No. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Okay, they came down from the mountain. Let's go to two. Go back to this because I want to make sure that we catch our word, all right? I pointed it out at the end. The third word from the end of the first sentence in verse 2, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John high mountain, transfigured before them. This is a word you're going to latch on to. Watch the Greek word for this. And, and then there's some New Testament that we want you to pick up on. The word transfigured is the Greek metamorpho. It, it literally, um, that, I don't know why I tell you this stuff. This is not like I'm going to go around and try to use the word in inflection. But uh, metamorpho, oh, ooh. <laughs> okay, just for, just for the record, it's metamorpho, oh, ooh. It really is. That's how you, it's metamorpho, oh, ooh. Um, I, I, that's just free. That's free knowledge that you needed for life to change. But here's the definition, to change into another form. What's most important about metamorpho is that we derive the English word metamorphosis. And what is Metamorphosis, but to go from one, well, it's literally to change into another form. And our most popular usage of metamorphosis in which one thing changes from one into another form is probably caterpillars and butterflies. Most of us learned what metamorphosis was 
from the entire caterpillar to butterfly or maybe maggot to fly. That's not near as romantic as caterpillar to butterfly, but the caterpillar to butterfly is, is a literal, is a great example of metamorphosis because it literally cocoons itself and then transforms into a butterfly. It comes out in a completely different form than it goes in. And there's some really cool spiritual imagery to the metamorphosis process that a caterpillar goes into being a butterfly because you know the caterpillar cocoons himself and rests and the transformation comes when he rests but the true transformation comes when he stresses himself out of the cocoon and so as the caterpillar who has now become a butterfly breaks the cocoon he gains the ability to, to use those wings and that literally if you tear the cocoon away from a butterfly and you let the butterfly out because you feel sorry for said butterfly. Like, look at him, he's never gonna get out of that cocoon. You kill him because if you help him out, he doesn't learn to use his wings and, well, he can't. There's some sort of chemical reaction that happens in those wings that needs the stress of coming out of that cocoon. There's some good spiritual imagery there, and there's some negative spiritual imagery there. The, the, the good's obvious. I mean, we go from one thing to another thing. The caterpillar was always a butterfly. Even before he was a butterfly, it's in him to be a butterfly. It's sort of like us. We meet Christ, and there's a lot. The resurrected reality of who we can be in Christ is in us, even if it's not showing up in us. It's sort of that butterfly side of who we are in Christ versus the caterpillar side you see. There's some negative connotations as well of, of stress and strain to be transformed. In our case, Christ went through the stress and strain at Calvary so that he could come out of the other side of the tomb and, and be transformed on our behalf. And then we identify with that and we become transformed. Either way, there's a metamorphosis. And this word's not popular in the New Testament. This is not a common, this, isn't, this doesn't pop up in just every book. And it's very specific to incident. It's not, not a word you just throw out there to describe something going on around you. It's, it's always, when it's used in the New Testament, has a spiritual connotation. It trumps anything the Old Testament has to offer because the Old Testament leaves you, you can't change your spots, you can't change your skin, you are what you are, do evil, you can't do good. And then the New Testament comes along and uses metamorpho and goes, there's a possibility that you could change from being what you are to being what you could be. And what does that metamorphosis look like? So Jesus stands on a mountain and metamorphosizes in front of them. He becomes what he is on the inside. It, it shines through. Mark's statement of wider than a launderer could make him. And he, the, the appearance of what happens on that mountain is, is well, powerful. And it, it's off the charts in regards to how they know to describe it. But, and they don't try again. It's not as if they walk down the mountain and go, hey, here's what we saw. In fact, they have to keep it quiet until he resurrects because why he's doing it is a symbol of transformation in which something goes in and dies, caterpillar, something comes out alive, butterfly. Nobody messes with it until Paul. So Paul, and I think it's telling because Paul is Saul and he's, he's not just played with the darkness, he's embraced the darkness in regards to his treatment of fellow man. And there's something to be said there that's a deep, that's a deep thought. That Saul's a bad dude, but he's religious and he's better at it than all of us. And that's a, that ought to tell us something. He's, I mean, he's better at being religious. And he would have been thought to be a really good guy. And, uh, and he metamorphosizes. He, he goes from Saul to Paul. and it's a, it, He's blinded. He goes through all the process. He's blinded and then he can get his sight back. And he's rejected by his fellows. There's a microcosm in some ways of, of uh, your Christian experience right there in Paul. So Paul grabs the word. Now, Paul doesn't grab the transfiguration story. Peter does, strangely. I mean, Peter was there. Peter uses it in 1st or 2nd Peter. Paul never uses the story, but he uses the word. And he uses it in a way that shows you the possibility is real. So 
let me show it to you again. You've, you've all seen it, but you might not have known it was there. Romans 12, 2, Paul says this, do not be conformed to this world. The word world, by the way, is not cosmos. That would mean the planet and everything in it. The word world there is the word eon, which is better translated age. Do not be conformed to this age. And speaking, there's a lot you could say about that. What I do think Paul is saying is there's, a, there's, a, there's something going on in the world. And I opened here today with talking about victimhood. and Don't be identified with, okay, that's a very thing going on in the world. So I'm going to say what Paul said. Don't be conformed to the way the world thinks in this age. Okay? It's the way the world thinks in this age is not always good for you. So Paul says, don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And the word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho. It is to transfigure. You literally could have translated it, and I wish they would have, because it would have made us, it would have popped. We would have caught it if he would have said, be not conformed to this world, but transfigure by renewing your mind. And we all would have went, transfigure, that's what Jesus did, isn't it? Yes, it's exactly what Jesus did. And Paul's grabbing that idea of transfiguration, how? By renewing your mind, by constantly renewing and changing, repenting is another good word for that, changing the, the thought processes of your mind. Don't get stagnant in the way that you think. Listen a lot. Pay attention. Keep your mind moving and growing and working because that's how you transform. You could say this in a practical way. If you want to change, if there's something about you you don't like, how can you change it? Well, it would start by changing the way you think about it. It might start by changing the way you think about your day or your body or your mind or your neighbor or your job or insert issue here. As you change the way you think about it, you change the way you deal with it. If you don't change the way you think about it, you don't change the way you deal with it. You just continue to go down that road. We're talking spiritually for sure. Don't be conformed to the age. Transform by renewing your mind so you can prove that word prove, I don't know if that helps us or not, because we prove is like prove it to us. But that's not what that word means. That word is discern. It's, we make a determination. We can literally discern the will of God for our life. We can discern who we are and where we belong by renewing our mind and watching a renewed mind transform who we are. Is this a fast process? No, it's painfully and dreadfully slow. And that's okay because the Holy Spirit doesn't wear a watch. And so he doesn't care about how fast these transformation process takes. But what's your role in transformation? What are you supposed to do? Change your mind and put new information in it. And if it's had nothing but the same old information in there and you're getting the same old results, you don't need to work harder. You need to Put new information in your mind. You need to change your mind. You know why people get turned on by revelation? Why they hear a sermon, a word. Because I, I, this stuff blows my mind. They go like, how does somebody just like click across something? And they hit play and it moved them. And then they go, oh, I'm going to listen to more. You know, I want, I want more of that. What is that? What's, what does that? I mean, how do you make that happen? Well, I don't know. There's not, it's not... I don't know anything about marketing, so I don't know what makes them come back. So all I know is that as they put some information in their mind, something changed. Just a little bit. I don't mean like their whole life changed. Something changed. Just a little bit of spark in them where they went, hmm, I haven't thought about that before. I'd like to know a little more about that. And then... At, they're starting to information starting to come in. This is why cultic mentality is limit the inflow of outside information to the people. Don't let your body of followers in a cult feed on outside information. Why? Well, because I don't trust this outside. No, here's what happens. The moment that you open your mind to take something in, you can have the possibility of changing your mind. And that mind change will lead to a transformation. 
So you might say, I don't know why I don't feel the way I used to feel about this. Yeah, you do, because you had more information. And as you begin to have more information, you begin to change your mind about it. So there's a process of transformation that's completely in your hands, even godly, grace-centered transformation. And that process is change your information, change the station, and I, maybe literally, but most likely metaphorically, change the information coming in so that your transformation begins to line up the direction that you're looking to go. And so we would, we would understand that if you said it like in athletics, so you want a different result in the way you're performing in game, then you need to do this during the week. And we would go, well, I understand that. That makes sense. There's a little bit of that even in the realm of the spirit. I need to take in the information. And what does that information look like? So this is, this is incomplete because this is just a verse that tells you to renew your mind. Renew your mind to what? I mean, don't be conformed to the age of renew your mind. What do I really need to take in? So I think, it, I think there's a little more that we can get into. Let's jump back to the transfiguration story to set that, that up. Okay. Elijah appeared to him with Moses. They were talking with Jesus, and Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. This blows my mind. A, that they recognize Moses and Elijah. B, that this is the best thing Peter could come up with. There's <laughs> three little tents. Because literally the word tabernacle is tents. I mean, it's just like, it's the tabernacle in the wilderness. And Peter's doing the best he knows how to do, because what did Moses do? Well, he had a tabernacle. Maybe we make a tabernacle for him and keep him around. But what's the mentality that Moses has? I mean, first of all, why do they recognize him? I think it just becomes obvious. There's something that happens at the top of the mountain that shows the personification of the law and the prophets. Because the law and the prophets are the twin pillars of Judaism at this time. You got, the, you got the law, which is the Torah, and you have the prophets, which is everything else, and you have all the rabbinical teaching that stands or falls on that. Pharisee, Sadducee, whatever. They all stand and fall on the law and the prophets. Jesus teaches from that point of view. Remember? He goes, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your mind, love your neighbor as yourself, for on these hang the law and the prophets. So what was he doing? He was going, everything you've ever known, law and prophets, it's all wrapped up in how you love the Lord and how you love your neighbor. So you could read the law and the prophets through that lens. You could literally go back in the Old Testament and go, God was trying to teach you how to love God. God was trying to teach you how to love your neighbor. Man messes that up. But the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets are personified by two characters in the Old Testament. Peter doesn't look at these two characters and go, hey, what's David and Daniel doing up here? Although he had as much knowledge about what David and Daniel looked like as he did Moses and Elijah. You know, why doesn't he say, why is Isaiah and Jeremiah up here with you, Jesus? He knows immediately that we're dealing with the law and the prophets because the entire ministry of Jesus had been built upon a foundation of the law and the prophets. And all we're seeing at Transfiguration is the personification of those two ideas, Moses and Elijah. And the best thing Peter can come up with is let's build three houses. And I know it's funny to go with that. He couldn't do any better than that. But you, if you put yourself in their shoes, you, can know, you know exactly why he said it. Because... Heaven on earth is the temple. It is the place that God sits. And for Peter, he is honoring Jesus with this statement. Because if you're a good Jewish man and you've got Moses and Elijah standing there, well, heck yeah, we're going to build a couple temples for these two guys because they belong in it. We want to put you in one too, Jesus, because we think you're... Peter thinks he's complimenting Jesus. I mean... I think you're as good as Moses and Elijah. I, I, I just want you to know that as far as I'm concerned, you are the law and the prophets. I mean, you're as good as it gets. Let's build three houses so you can stay here. There's a clinging to, because how this usually gets taught is that, you know, you're clinging to the law and the prophets and God wants you to see that you got to let the law and the prophets go. Well, there's a piece of that, but really Peter's just, trying to show Jesus how much he thinks of him. You belong in the same place as the law and the prophets. Paul would say this in, in, in Romans 3.21, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe there is no difference. So Paul elevates 
Paul puts Jesus above the law and the prophets. He says the law and the prophets witness of Jesus, right? And what are the law and the prophets? Moses, the giver of the law, Elijah, the ultimate prophet. And so for Paul, his message is that these are witnessing of who Jesus is. What does the voice boom down from heaven at transfiguration and say? Remember, this is my son, hear him. And when they look up, Moses and Elijah are gone. So what's the message God is sending? Forget the law and the prophets, you got the real deal. Or as Paul would say, forget the law and the prophets, you have the righteousness of God revealed. The law and the prophets is not the righteousness of God. Jesus is the righteousness of God. He has revealed the law and the prophets simply testify of him. And when given the chance to be put on the same level as Jesus, Moses and Elijah disappear because they can't be on the same level of Jesus no matter how hard Peter tries. And so don't, don't diss Peter. He does what he's, he's doing the best he knows. He goes, we ought to put you up there with the Moses and Elijah. I think you belong. And God steps in and goes, no, they don't belong. See how God turns that and does it in a way that he doesn't make Peter look stupid. But God steps up and says, no, Jesus doesn't need to go on the same level with them. They can't stay on the same level with my son. Hear, and God says this, this is my beloved son, hear him. It's God's way. This is an amazing story because nobody gets healed. Nobody gets fed. Nobody walks on water. And there's no words written in red. The story of the Mount of Transfiguration makes no logical sense to the progression of the Jesus story. It's almost as if it's an aside. I mean, really, nobody healed, nobody, no dead raised, no Jesus talk, no words written in red. What do we get out of this? Literally, what do we get out of the Mount of Transfiguration if not this? Nobody gets to stand on equal footing with Jesus. He is the voice of God. The law and the prophets disappear when he comes on the scene. No more Moses, no more Elijah. And so whenever we prop up the law and the prophets as if they are contributors to the spiritual development of God's people, we don't understand true metamorphosis because Jesus metamorphosizes in front of his disciples and he's the only one left on the field. And it's important that you realize that Jesus to this day is the only one left on the field. There's nobody left. Now, how do we do this? You need to renew our mind to what? How do we make that happen? Watch Paul. 2 Corinthians 3, we'll bring it home. This was, we did this Tuesday night. I did verse 17 on Tuesday night because verse 17 is one of those worship verses where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And I think I said Tuesday night that I used to get this quoted to me all the time. And then I used to quote it too when I was leading worship. Like, ah, oh, man, the Holy Ghost is here today. I'll tell you what, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Everybody in this room ought to be free. And so if the Spirit of the Lord is here, and that means there's liberty. And as we dealt with Tuesday night, I don't want to go back over it, but that has anything to do with singing songs. And the minute that people feel it, then they're really free. And before they felt it, they weren't really free. Um, no, this is not an emotionally based scripture. It is. There are no more veils on God's people that are holding them back that are trying to cover up their deficiencies and their inefficiencies and their lack of performance. And they don't have to hide anymore. And why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is here and the Spirit of the Lord lives in them. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, they're truly free. They don't have to fake it anymore. They are who they are. They are what they are. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, but we all with an unveiled face, no more mosaic veil, okay? With an unveiled face, Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed. Metamorpho, ooh. Here's Paul's other usage. We are being transfigured. We are literally changing, not figuratively changing. He wouldn't have used metamorpho if you just figuratively changed. It's just a mental ascent. No, he says as, first of all, it's the Holy Spirit. Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Second, get rid of the veil. You got to get rid of the mask. Quit faking it because we're not talking about fake transformation. Fake it till you make it junk. There's not, there's no more veils, all right? So there's the Holy Spirit. There's no more veils. We're unveiled face. We are looking at the glory of the Lord. We're beholding it as if in a mirror. What's, a, what's that mean? I'm looking at it as if it's me. I take a look at who he is 
as if that's who I am. That's mind change. I'm putting information into my mind that I don't necessarily have, but I'm seeing it in him and I'm putting it in me. And as I behold his image in that mirror, I am transfigured. You can put that word right there because that's the same thing happening to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration that Paul says happens to you. I'm transfigured into the same image. What image? The image of Jesus that I was staring at. That's not me. That's him. But I'm putting that information into me and I'm transforming into who he is. As I see him love the unlovable, I get to where I can love the unlovable. As I pay attention to him paying attention to people, I start to pay attention to people. When I stop seeing that in him, I stop seeing that in me. When I start seeing love and mercy and peace in him, well, lo and behold, I find myself transforming, transfiguring into the same image from glory to glory. This is a, it's, it's a step and then another step and then another step. It's not an overnight event. It's something that happens to me progressively from glory to glory. And who does it? The Spirit of the Lord. What did you have to do there? You got to look in the mirror. You got to keep finding information to transform your mind with. You do have a role in this verse. And the role is to keep staring at the one in whatever way you can find him. When you look in this book, that's what you're looking for is what would he do and who is he? And what has he done to change my life right here? And how can who he is become who I am? Not so that I can try to go do better, but so that I know I am better. Again, this doesn't discount some of the stuff I might need to do in life. I think if you start staring in the mirror and realizing who he is, you'll get rid of the victimhood garbage because you realize it won't define you anymore. If you find yourself answering stuff with as a, and then insert something here, you've just been co-opted into collective thinking. You know, as a woman, here's how I feel about that. No, wait, it should be as you, not as a woman. Don't speak as if you're the whole gender. And don't take offense as if you have to because you're a woman. You know, as a black man, as a homosexual, as a straight male, Whoa, you are you, you are not the collective, and you've bought the lie that your thought processes are best defined by the group rather than the individual. And that's the God of this age, is that collectivism thinking that makes you feel the way you feel as a this. This is how I feel. I, man, when people say as a and then tell me how they feel about something, I don't think they've ever been honest with themselves. They've come up with a group reflection. You know, as a, as a young person, I think this, and I go, oh, you don't, that's not you. I don't even say as a Christian, here's how I feel. Cause that doesn't tell you anything. That tells you how I think I ought to feel. You know, as a Christian, my response is this. Okay. You big whoop, but who are you? And so you do have a role. So own it and live up to it and embrace it. And your role is to see who he is. And is aspiration too big of a word? No, aspire. Aspire for that kind of transformation and realize that true heart transformation is gonna happen because of the Holy Spirit, not because of you. It's gonna happen because of the Spirit of the Lord, but I'm gonna to have to put the information in there. And if I'm not putting the information in there and then I'm going, oh, well, I mean, I'm just gonna go, I just am what I am. They go, well, are you, are you paying attention to your identity? Are you feeding on who Christ is? What information are you putting in your head? Nothing. All day long. Nothing? Okay. Well, then this is what you've become. You have, you're a reflection of a lot of the stuff you're putting in. And we used to do this through a legalistic lens. We'd go, well, if you're listening to this, that's the way you're going to act. There was some truth to that in that the more you pour in, the more you're going to live out. That eventually happens. But in the process of transformation, we have to take a look at who he is. Now watch how this happens. Watch how this affects us because this is, this is the end of the chapter. So if you're reading this at home and you're going through 2 Corinthians 3, you get to the end and you go, well, you're going to change from the image from glory to glory. By the Spirit of the Lord, you go, praise God. The Holy Spirit's going to do the work. 
And Paul didn't stop writing. That's just us. We get to the end of the chapter and we figure, well, he's done. Watch how four starts. Therefore, and man, when you get a therefore, then you need to find out what it's there for. And so now you know you've been staring at Jesus. Therefore, since we have this ministry, that's an interesting phrase. Paul is saying, look, I know what I'm here to tell you to do. And since I know that, and since that's a part of who we are and what we do, as we have received mercy, we don't lose heart. Why would we lose heart? Just think about that for a minute. What, what purpose is that phrase? What do we lose heart about? I think it's easy to lose heart when you're wanting to transform and you're staring into the image and you're not transforming. And Paul goes, oh, don't lose heart. This tells me it's going to be slow and you're going to be tempted to lose heart. It's a good, don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. Why? Because we've renounced the hidden things of shame. We made a decision. Here, watch this. We made a decision. We renounced the hidden things of shame. We're not walking in craftiness, handling the Word of God deceitfully. I think handling the Word of God deceitfully is, is putting veils back on of performance and works. And, and it could be a lot of other things as well. We're not walking in craftiness or handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Don't tell me that you don't have anything to do. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Wouldn't it be a whole lot more fun if the previous passage didn't have this tacked onto it right at the end? Because we could just walk out of here talking about transformation and it wouldn't matter whether any of it happened or not. And Paul goes, don't lose heart. If it doesn't happen the way you want it to, we're not backing off of this. We've already made a decision about who we are. We've laid a bunch of junk aside. We're not going to twist the scriptures now. And we're not going to tw twist who we are in Christ to make this go thing go away or to try to make it go faster. And yes, we do have a responsibility for the consciousness of our neighbor. And we need to pay attention to that because the transformation that we're undergoing affects the rest of the world. And the faster we own up to that, the better we'll be on the planet. And we'll be worth something to people. See, I think the reason a lot of people turned on the church is because they're worthless to people. I mean, all they do is ask people for time and money. They don't transform in front of them. They don't love the unlovable and feed the hungry and change lives. And if you're not doing that, then what good are you on the earth? And it becomes too easy then to extenuate all of our negatives when we don't have very many positives. We, read, we watch the life of Jesus and we are amazed that they were able to crucify him because he did good all the time. They had to work really, really hard to crucify him. I mean, he goes to the cross on a, he goes to the cross basically on a lie. He doesn't fight the lie. He has to go to the cross. We know why he's going, but he hasn't murdered anyone. He hasn't killed anybody. He hasn't led an insurrection. He hasn't lifted a sword against Caesar. He hasn't declared himself to be king. He hasn't put a throne on his head. He hasn't, or a crown on his head or sat on a throne. He hasn't even written a book. He hasn't passed legislation. He hasn't run for office. He's fed the hungry. He's raised the dead. He's opened the eyes of the blind. I mean, he's, he's hurt some feelings religiously. He's, he's done some stuff, that's for sure. But he goes, the, he goes with the charge of blasphemy, calling himself God. My, my point is that it was difficult to put Jesus on the cross because at every turn you make, he makes the town a better place and the street a better place to live on. And that's what we ought to want to be. Or it would be difficult to speak against who we are. In fact, Peter felt that way. He gets to the end of his letter and he says, Live in a way in which if people persecute you, it won't be because you're living evil. It'll be because you're living well. And you go, that's a pretty good thought. And where did he get that? Well, he watched Jesus transfigure in front of him. And I think he lived the rest of his life going, that's the guy I want to be. That's the shining light that I want to represent in front of the world. True transformation is possible. It's going to happen by the Holy Spirit. What do you need to do? Start to pour things into your mind that matter about who you are. Figure out who he is. Figure out who you are. And start to pour that into your mind about who you are. If you keep feeding yourself the information that isn't who you are, it will be reflected in how you treat the world around you and how you view yourself. And you will walk out with a victim mentality in a world that celebrates victims, and that's the tragedy. And you walk out, instead of looking to be the hero, you just embrace being the victim. And I think it's a darkness that we really gotta watch out for.
that's happening in the church now. Not just, not, well, let me say that. It's happening in the world. And I, I don't know that the church has taken a stand against it enough. So watch. Pour into your mind the good. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word, and I thank you for helping us tonight with this word. And I pray for the people here and watching and listening that the possibility of transformation is enough for them to move forward towards it. And they'll start to pour into their mind who you are and who they are in you. And I thank you that you're going to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.